In 1 John 1 and verse 9, John by inspiration tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, we've heard the good news already that Ted and Amanda Entwistle have been restored to their first love. They've confessed slothfulness is what Ted mentioned on his card. And we love this couple. They're former members here. And they're back wanting to work. They both express that. You know, now don't take this wrong. I just didn't know Amanda at the same age I met Ted. But Ted's one of my favorite young men to come through Centerville Road. I'm not sure exactly how old he was when Gary and Judith, his parents, came. I'm wanting to say somewhere junior high, but middle school now. But he's just a, a great, great young man. He wants to do the Lord's work. And so he was a lot of fun taking to camp. He was always ready for every adventure. So we're glad that Ted and Amanda are back with us. Please welcome them. Again, it's good to see Sister Irene. After a pretty severe accident, here she is, again, ready to worship her God. Good to see everyone tonight. We're going to get quickly into our study. This is our series on Ecclesiastes. Probably shouldn't tell you tonight, but we have 28 slides. It might be the longest by way of slides. It's not going to be the longest lesson because most of these slides we're just simply going to read together. Okay, So we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. This whole series is primarily for young people. But again, those of us who are older, we're not excluded. These lessons apply equally to us. Three urgent duties for young people. Remember what these are. Rejoice. Likewise, remove. And also, remember. These come from Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 9. That's where we're taught to rejoice. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 10, that's where young people are told to remove and put away sorrow and evil from their heart. And Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, three successive verses. 12 and verse 1, that's where Solomon teaches youth and us to remember. Now, notice some things. In Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 9, I know we're sort of going back a little bit tonight. We've looked at verse 9. We've looked at verse 10. We're now poised to begin looking at verse 1 of chapter 12. We'll get there tonight, but we're taking a little bit longer road. Now, let me suggest this. Please, this week, please look at the scripture that was read a few moments ago. Read Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 through verse 7. What you're going to see in those difficult days, here is an analogy. Here is very figurative, symbolic language of growing old. And so he talks about remembering God in the days of our youth. Why? Because the difficult days are coming. Days of infirmity. And then he also gets in verses 6 and 7 to not only older age, but even death. When the silver cord is broken. And so please be studying that. That's what we'll be turning our attention to next Sunday night, Lord willing. But right now, a word of cheer. We're going back to chapter 11 and verse 9. Look at this. Here's the word of cheer. First thing God says when he is challenging young people, he says, rejoice. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. So a word of cheer, what's that word of cheer? Rejoice. Rejoice. Look at this quote. I ran across it a long time ago. I loved it. In fact, I, I laughed out loud when I first read it. But it sort of catches you off guard. It says, happiness is no laughing matter. Well, you know what? It's not, is it? God views happiness as something very serious. Look at this. God's serious about our happiness. 
Now, young people, he's serious about your happiness. He's serious about my happiness. He's serious about each and every one of us, our happiness. Happiness is no laughing matter. Consider this. He didn't create us to be miserable. We've mentioned that before, but I wanted to state it again. Some people have a warped concept of God, thus a warped concept of life. And I think that's why in Ecclesiastes 2 and verse seven, uh, 17, you hear someone saying in that book, therefore I hated life. Well, when you're not living it like you should, and when you don't understand your purpose, your aim, your mission on earth, that's probably what will happen. You won't understand life. You won't enjoy life. But again, he didn't create us to be miserable. Young people, he didn't bless you with youth to be unhappy. This is a time, childhood and youth, where God specifically says, you rejoice, O young man, in your youth. God wants us to rejoice. He created us to be happy, but he's also revealed that we'll only be happy in him. Now think about this. We search for happiness. I'm talking about mankind. We search for happiness in some of the strangest places. And we search in places that happiness can never be found. And then we wonder why we're not happy. We're looking in the wrong places. We're only going to be happy in God. We'll only be happy in Jesus Christ. And so think about these verses. Happy are the people who are so situated. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 144 and verse 15. You remember after the eunuch obeyed the gospel? Philip had taught him. He says, look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with that confession of sin, of sin and Christ. They go down in the water. Philip baptizes the eunuch. And the Bible tells us in Acts 8 and verse 39, he went on his way rejoicing. He was now happy. Happy in Christ. Happy in life. Happy because he was baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. In Matthew 19 and verse 22, just the opposite. Just the opposite of the eunuch. He went on his way rejoicing. The rich young ruler, he went on his way sorrowful. Have you ever noticed that contrast? And why such a contrast? Well, the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, we've just heard, because he was baptized into Christ. He was obedient to his Lord. The rich young ruler went on his way sorrowful because he couldn't bring himself to part with all of his earthly possessions. He would not follow the Christ. In Luke 10 and verse 20, I want you to think about this for just a moment. God not only tells us to rejoice, but he tells us what to rejoice in. You remember when the 70 came back? And when they went, they were given power, power over demons. And when they came back in Luke 10 and verse 20, they are taught by Jesus not to rejoice that you have power over the spirits, over the demons but rejoice that your names are enrolled in heaven. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. But here's what I want you to rejoice in. That's what the Bible does for us, young and old alike. God says, Ken, don't rejoice in that. That's nothing for you to rejoice in. But rejoice in this. And isn't it interesting that Jesus says, you rejoice that your names are enrolled in heaven. That's something to rejoice in and about. Think about this. God says rejoice, but wants us to rejoice in the right things. He says rejoice, but also teaches us that there are limits to our joy, pleasure, and rejoicing. There are limits. We've just said that. 
Don't rejoice in that, but rejoice in this. Limits to our joy. Remember Job 20 and verse 5? The triumphing of the wicked is short-lived. The joy of the godless is momentary. There's the limit to joy. Don't rejoice in what the godless do. Again, limits to our pleasure. Sin has pleasure, but it's only for a season, isn't it? Hebrews 11 and verse 25. And limits to our rejoicing. You know, I often thought for many years that Jeremiah 6 and verse 15 was one of the saddest verses, not just in Jeremiah, but in all the Bible. Were they ashamed because of all their abominations? No, they were not ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. Now, as sad as that is, do you realize in Jeremiah 11 and verse 15, there's even a sadder verse? It says, but you rejoice when you do evil. It's sad that we can't blush any longer over our shame, what we ought to be ashamed about. But it's even worse when we rejoice in evil. That's when and how the people rejoice. So think about that, that word of cheer, rejoice. But God tells us who and what to rejoice in. Think about this. When Solomon says rejoice, it stands as an affront to gloomy asceticism. Young people, I'm so thankful that God told you and me to rejoice The ascetic, they don't get it. Again, think about this. Now, here's a definition for asceticism. Asceticism is the doctrine that teaches a person can only attain a high spiritual and moral state by rigorous self-denial and extreme abstinence. Now, we should understand that self-denial and abstinence, that's part of the Christian walk, okay? Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Luke 9 and verse 23. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. There are some things, legitimately, that we have to deny ourselves. There are some things, biblically, that we abstain from. But the ascetic, they go so far, they don't want any pleasure whatsoever. Even that which is permitted, even when God says rejoice, O young man, in your youth, they would say we'd rather not. We'd rather be miserable. We'd rather be unhappy. We'd rather go to an extreme, extreme self-denial, rigorous self-denial. Well, the Bible doesn't teach quote-unquote rigorous self-denial. Now, some would say, oh, yes, it does, because they don't want to deny themselves at all. But the Bible, instead of teaching rigorous self-denial, teaches righteous self-denial. If you want to remain right with God, then you don't go there. You don't do that. You deny that. You abstain from that. But notice this, the word of caution, bringing us again to verse 10. The word of caution, notice this, therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. When Solomon says remove and put away, he issues a a rebuke to foolish and futile Epicureanism. Now, I want you to see these extremes. Asceticism is one extreme. We're not going to enjoy anything. We're going to deny ourselves even legitimate pleasures. Epicureanism, on the other hand, says that's all there is to enjoy, pleasure. Notice this definition, if you will. Epicureanism is the doctrine that the highest good in life is to be found in pleasure and excess indulgence. That's what the Epicurean says. You remember 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32? Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, that's that philosophy. Eat and drink, let's just be merry. Why? Because tomorrow we die. 
You remember in Luke 12, verse 19, the rich farmer, the rich fool? You remember when he tore down his old barns? They simply weren't big enough to hold his abundant harvest. He built new ones. And remember, he had a talk with himself. He said to his soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. Well, that's Epicureanism. Do you realize in Acts 17, in the city of Athens, when Paul preached, in verse 18, do you know he faced both the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers? The Stoics were a lot like the ascetics, okay? They were Stoic in life. They were rigid. They didn't want pleasure. Well, Paul was an affront to both of them. Solomon is rebuking both of those. Yes, we are to rejoice, but we're not to rejoice in worldly pleasures. Regarding those, we remove those from ourselves. We put those away. And so notice, Solomon is teaching that privileges, meaning rejoicing, what he's just talked about, that privileges must be balanced by responsibilities. As you rejoice, you still remove, you still put away from your heart those sorrows and those evils that Solomon has talked about. While childhood is fleeting, remember that's what verse 10 says. For childhood is fleeting, it is vanity, that term vanity, as we mentioned last week, it means, you know, transitory. It's not going to last forever. And so while childhood is fleeting, childhood is still important. Solomon was not saying childhood is vanity. Why are we even going through that phase, that stage in our life? No, that's not his point. Again, it's fleeting, but it's still important. And here's why it's important, young people. It's in childhood, it's in young man or womanhood that we do these things. We form the right habits now. We establish a good name and reputation while we're young. We build strong character today. Again, you know, last Wednesday, if you were in Bible class, Tyler was talking about the Christian's armor in Ephesians 6, and he was talking about laying a solid foundation. That's what every child of God should do. And that's what childhood is, should be for all of us. That's when we lay a strong foundation. That's when we remember God, because if we think childhood and young manhood is hard, Harder days than that are on the horizon. We need to be wise and lay that foundation so when more difficult days come, we're ready. We're prepared. We can handle those days. You remember, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Psalm 119 and verse 9. It's by his deeds that a lad distinguishes himself if his conduct is pure and right. Proverbs 20 and verse 11. Let no man look down on your youth, but, he says, in your speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of the believers. That's Paul's advice to young Timothy. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. That's Solomon's advice to young people. Notice. Young people who are wise enough, strong enough, courageous enough to avoid and remove evil now can enjoy a clear conscience with self and peace with God. There's no greater life to be lived than that right there. I don't care if you're young or old. When you have a clear conscience with self and you're at peace with God, then and only then can you really seriously, genuinely rejoice. You found happiness in this life. Look at some of these quotes. These are quotes that I've run across over the years, fit perfectly with what we're talking about. Youthful sins lay a foundation for aged sorrows. That's exactly what Solomon is talking about. 
When he's talking about in childhood, in young manhood, to remove sorrows from your heart, to remove evil from your flesh, what's he saying? Those youthful sins, they do nothing more than lay a foundation for aged sorrows. If you've lived long enough, you've talked to people, and they wish they would have lived differently in years gone by. Many of them, and when I say cannot, we know they can. But because of their present deeds, look at Hosea 5 and verse 4 tonight. Hosea is saying they can't return to the Lord. And why is that? Because of the way they're presently living. It's true. If we're going to live in that state in sin, it's impossible to be renewed to repentance. Hebrews 6 and verse 6. We can be renewed to repentance, but we've got to change our ways. And some are carrying way too much baggage to do it, they think. I've lived this way for too long, I can't change. It'd just be an overall, you know, change. Yes, it would be. It is for any of us, for all of us. But it's worth it. And so youthful sins lay a foundation for aged sorrows. Look at this. It cannot trouble you tomorrow if you avoid it today. It simply can't hurt you. It can't trouble you tomorrow if you remove it today, if you avoid it today. Again, think about this. When you're tempted, always turn to the right. <laughs> We're not talking direction. We're talking devotion. When you're tempted, young or old, always turn to the right. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. And the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You see, when we turn to the right, when we turn to God, when we turn to His Word, when we remove today those temptations, those sins, that's when we can live with that clear conscience, at peace with God. And that's when they won't trouble us tomorrow because we've rejected them today. You know, men who are my age and maybe even younger, we've learned this. We've learned this. Julie keeps reminding me of this. So, so if I haven't learned it yet, it's not her fault. And sometimes I haven't learned it. But we've all heard this, work smarter, not harder. Good advice. I don't really care about this quote right now, but again, to adapt it for us, for young people, notice, live smarter, not harder. Live smarter, not harder. What are we saying? We're saying exactly what Proverbs 13 and verse 15 says. The way of the transgressor is hard. It's hard. It's hard to live the life of sin. Oh, we don't fully understand it at times because we think this is so much fun. This is bringing us so much pleasure. This is great. This is wonderful. We need to ask the question, what will we do in the end thereof? Jeremiah 5 and verse 31. Live smarter, not harder. The way of the transgressor is hard. But Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's living smarter, not harder. You remember Romans 1 and verse 22? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Well, that's what happens when people live in the world and engage in sin. Professing themselves to be wise, they think they're living smarter. They're not living smarter. They're living very foolishly. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, we can turn that around biblically. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 10, Paul says we are fools for Christ's sake. So instead of professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves fools for Christ's sake, they became wise. The wisest young person, the wisest young adult, the wisest middle-aged individual, the wisest old person is the person who loves the Lord.
person who's seeking, striving with all their being to live faithful to Him. That's living smarter, not harder. Well, words of counsel. We've come to verse 1 of chapter 12. Remember. Now, again, think about it. Rejoice. Remove. Now, remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Read this with me. With these words, Solomon answers two questions. The first, how? How can I rejoice? You, know, you read Ecclesiastes and you wonder, how can I rejoice? This is a world that it seems like everything's vain, everything's futile. So how can I rejoice? And the second question, why? Not only how, but why? Why should I remove anything from my life? Well, that's what Solomon is, is answering. Again, how can I rejoice? Well, you rejoice by remembering your Creator. Why should I remove anything? Because if you don't, now in your youth, you're making it more difficult to serve the Lord later, to come back to Him later, before the difficult days come and the years draw nigh. When you say, I have no pleasure in them. Solomon is saying, you do these things, what? Remember your Creator before that happens. Now you're ready when more difficult days come. Notice the counsel. He now gives a simple, sincere, straightforward, uh, sensible, sound, and altogether spiritual. That's what Solomon, he's trying to help young people. He's made mistakes himself. In fact, notice this. He does not parrot the fatal counsel of his or our day. We do not hear, God wants you to be happy. Again, you only live once, so make the most of it, or follow your own heart. This is the futile, the fatal counsel of our day, and I'm sure it was in Solomon's day too. But you don't hear that. You don't hear that. Now, again, it's a half-truth that says God wants you to be happy. He does. He does. But not in the sense so many use it. Many times we're looking at sinful pleasures. We're looking at things that are in violation to God's will. And we just flippantly say, well, in essence, I'm going to do this because God wants me to be happy. Well, again, He does. But He knows you're not going to be happy in sin. Not ultimately not eternally. And so again, you don't hear this coming from Solomon. With Solomon's inspired advice, he's saying, don't make my same mistakes. Don't repeat my foolish decisions. And don't follow in my footsteps. Solomon was the wisest man upon earth, made even wiser by inspiration. But he didn't always live according to that wisdom, did he? And we, we have not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3, in verse 15. But yet at times, sadly to say, we don't always live up to the wisdom that we have from God's will. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, here's where we're ending. Solomon explains what, who, when and why. Take your Bibles. This last point, just look at this quickly. Again, we're going to be picking it up next Sunday night here in chapter 12, verse 1, going through verse 7. But Solomon's answering these questions. The question of what? What is that? Look what he says. For what? He says, remember. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to remember. But he not only answers what, but who. Solomon, I know what you want me to do to remember, but who? Who do you want me to remember? Well, look what he says, reading from the New King James. Remember now your Creator. Notice that. That's who? Your God. Your Creator. See, it is He who made us not we ourselves. Psalm 100 and verse 3. 
He said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. So what? Remember. Who? Your creator. When? Well, the new King James says, remember now. Now, many say this should say, instead of remember now, it should say, and remember. Well, if that's the way it ought to be phrased, that still doesn't knock out the wind. Because notice, it goes on to say, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. That's when. When you're young. When you have vitality. When you have the strength. Again, you're not afflicted by these infirmities that we'll read about as you go on in verses 2 and following in Ecclesiastes 12. But remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And why? Well, look what he says. Look what's on the horizon. He says, before the difficult days come. Youth is a, ti a time of rejoicing. It's a time when really we don't have many problems or shouldn't. But he says, remember, that's vanity. That's fleeting. Thou, those days are not going to last forever. What is going to come after childhood, he says, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. I don't know if that last phrase... I don't know if it's saying when I have no pleasure in them, if it's talking mainly about serving God, or if it's just saying I have no pleasure in them, meaning my days. I really think it's the latter, but again, the former would be included in this in Ecclesiastes. I think it's going back to what we've already said. Remember we mentioned Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 17? When the individual there, after he has tried everything, he's tried the intellectual attempt, tried to figure out life, and he said, this is vanity. He tried the sensual attempt at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, and he says, this is vanity. He tried the materialistic attempt, his last and final attempt to find meaning, and he says, this is vanity too. And so the result of that is verse 17 in chapter 2. Therefore, I hated life. I hated life. I hated my days. I think that's exactly the commentary that we can go back to. Before the difficult days come, before the years draw near, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. What am I even doing here? What's life all about? You remember he who would love life and see good days? Let him refrain his mouth from speaking evil, his lips from deceit. Let him eschew evil. Let him seek peace and good. Again, that's what we're going to do in life. We're either going to learn to love life as God wants us to, or the result is going to be, therefore, I hated life. Find no pleasure in it. Too many people, too many people have that attitude right now toward life. You know why? Part of it is because they do not know, maybe they've never heard about Jesus Christ who came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I've never met a faithful child of God to say, therefore, I hated life. They always look upon the positive. They're optimistic. They know that the sufferings of this present life they're not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Romans 8 and verse 18. Let's keep thinking about these things. Please be reading Ecclesiastes 12 verses 1 through 7. What about it? Are you rejoicing tonight? And are you rejoicing in the right things? Are you rejoicing because you've removed and put away evil, sin? Are you remembering God? Yes, if you're young, but even if you're old. Let's remember our God who loves us so much. If you need tonight to make some changes, Ted and Amanda confess sin. Are you willing also with them? Maybe you've been baptized into Christ years before, haven't been living faithful. Will you likewise do the same? Will you repent? Will you confess? God stands ready to forgive. 
We looked at Psalm 86 and verse 5 this morning. God is good and ready to forgive. If you need to come back to the Lord, let's do it right now while we stand.